today. It just didn't feel right. We were all nervous because of what was hanging above us. Go the next 20 minutes as fast as you can. And then, after crossing the last ladder, a third avalanche came down. All I know, the next thing is we're tumbling upside down in that crevasse. I had come to the foot of Mount Everest in the Himalayas to see for myself the effects of climate change. But I never expected to be so directly confronted with the reality. The fact is that temperatures here are rising at an unprecedented rate, and avalanches and rockfalls are now far more common. This was not the first time. I've experienced the effects of climate change before. My name is Bernice Notenboom, and in the last 15 months I've been on expeditions to the North and South Pole, the Cold Pole in Siberia, and to Greenland. My goal? To let people around the world see what's happening to our planet. And in particular, to get children motivated to do something about it. Weet je waar ik de laatste jaar geweest ben? Zuidpool. Op de Zuidpool. Weet je hoe koud het op de Zuidpool is? <laughs> zeg maar. 40 graden onder nul. 40 graden onder nul. I've talked to children in Holland, the US and Canada and found a peer-to-peer -peer contact with kids in different parts of the world to be extremely powerful. To see children in Greenland draw a map of the houses that will go underwater with the rising sea level rings a loud bell with children in Holland. So I wanted to take with me the thoughts and wishes of the Dutch children and collect the same from the children in Nepal before taking them with me to the summit of Everest. Meer met de hand wassen. Minder computeren. Ja. Minder tv kijken. Sanne. Meer buiten spelen. So getting the kids involved and making them think about what they can do now is important. So I think it will stick with them. That's the other idea. As they grow, you know, they're all 11, 12 right now. This is something they will remember. So when they're 18, 19 years old, hopefully it will just be instilled in their brains and they, you know, automatically think of a better climate and do something about it. Kathmandu is the capital of Nepal, situated in the heart of the Himalaya and home to eight of the world's 14 tallest peaks. It's a real ragtag town of traggers, climbers, spiritual seekers and travelers tired of traveling the world and so they stop here. Walzer, Lazar and I met in Antarctica and got this idea to climb Mount Everest together. He climbed Everest three times before and his expertise as a mountain guide in Austria got me well prepared for this expedition. Buddhism has always held a special place in Nepal. It is also the religion of the mountain people like the Sherpas. From my previous expeditions, I had learned a little bit about the science of climate change. 
On this trip, I hope to find out how this affected a people and its culture. The Himalayas are the largest area covered by glaciers and permafrost outside the polar regions. But temperatures are rising here at three times the global average. The implications are dramatic. Not just for the local people living here, but for the 1.5 billion people living downstream in countries like China, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. This morning we were lucky to fly, but the weather is always unpredictable. The last time I was here, 17 years ago, to climb Amadablam, this was just a strip of dirt. We are a team of four, Walter and I, and Tomsky and Felix. <laughs> we'll make these guys rich. I met Tomsky in Antarctica and invited him because he is handy with computers, especially when they break down. He never gets upset, he has a zen attitude about our media commitment. You have a very perfect slim body. Really? Yeah. Oh, so maybe that's good for all women. Yeah, good <laughs> Felix is from Vienna and our doctor. He believes that Viagra is the best high-altitude medicine and hopes to prove it. He carries a portable ultrasound to study the climber's adaptation to the high elevation. No, he passed no, yeah. Together with the 12 porters and Sherpas and a train of yaks, we set up with all the equipment and supplies to Everest Base Camp. Everything is carried on your back. Some loads weigh more than me, weigh up to 70 to 80 kilos. It is a tough life for these porters, but the jobs are here in the Solokumbu with the tourists, or in construction far away in Dubai. Here you begin to see why Nepal as a country emits 125 times less CO2 than a country like Holland. I can't help wondering if everything being carried is really strictly necessary. So, what are the lease for? They're used for fertilizers. For potato fuel? Potato, yeah. yeah. For, for potato fuel. Pills, yeah. Uh -huh. For potatoes or barley. So we barley. can use everywhere, yeah. Uh -huh. He's a very young little fellow, very young, huh? Yeah. yeah. He's around 12, I think. 12. And how, how much do you think that weighs? Oh, Should we try to lift it? Hello. About 10 kilos, I think. 10 kilos. Ooh, it's heavy, eh? Yeah? It's fine. I guess the children here learn from an early age to carry loads. These green and verdant lower valleys of the Kumbu region are home to the Sherpas, or Eastern people. For 600 years, they have migrated from Tibet to these mountain valleys, bringing with them their Tibetan Buddhist traditions. Now, when I was here in Nepal the last time, this was a wooden bridge. Yeah, wooden bridge. Oh. oh, here we are at the famous Tutkosi River. Yeah. <laughs> Some accidents with Japanese tourists happened. Yeah. They well, were they, afraid they, of the yaks, yeah. and, and then when you are on the valley side, and the yaks are passing. You yeah, go you, you're going to go down. Wow. Oh, God. Oh God. <laughs> are you sure we're safe here? <laughs> I mean, it's really steep. The 
The winter monsoon stayed away this year. Hardly any flake of snow fell, and Kumjung is in a drought. Ironically, they're having a cold snap here in April, after suffering a much warmer and drier winter than usual. A lot of Sherpas assisting us on Everest come from this village. It feels special to be here. Maybe it's because the eyes of Buddha are piercing through me. The school here was established by Edmund Hillary, who together with Sherpa Tenzing Norgay were the first to summit Everest in 1953. Namaste. 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 <laughs> we're here because we wanted to look at your beautiful mountains and your beautiful village. But there's a problem here. And maybe you already know, because um, last year, in the winter, did you have any snow? No snow. No snow. What was that like to have no snow? What does that mean? Because the warm. It was too warm. So, what does that mean? What is happening? The, the climate is changing. So, what do you know about it? Tombushungu, <laughs> <laughs> We would like the children to think of something really special in Kumju yeah. they can take care of. And they can <laughs> it's great to see how much they know about the situation, both locally and globally, and are working to do something about it, like planting trees on the slopes below the village. What, what did you write here? Yeah, like just think about our generation and keep our environment clean. Don't throw the rope everywhere. Very good. It means keep clean because of the climate change. Yeah. Well, I see many important messages and I'm also very happy that the little ones come up with good messages and drawings. Now this is going back with us to Holland, yep. and then we're going to tell the Dutch children what you what you think is important yeah. for the environment in Nepal. Yeah. Thank you. For an expedition like this, it's vital to keep people on the home front regularly updated on our progress through blogs, photos and videos. Wrestling with this daily media output was going to prove a major challenge. Send it. You don't get upset? <laughs> no. Like me? <laughs> I'm used to this problem. I will just put the ISAC through the computer. <laughs> okay, fastest connection in solar combo region. <laughs> We have no nine hours and five minutes to sit in the internet cafe. <laughs> it will make these guys rich. This morning, when I woke up in my sleeping bag at six o'clock and I opened the curtain and I see Everest, that's a whole nother dimension. To me, that looks intimidating, it's impressive, it is the highest mountain in the world. And, and even now, it has this lenticular cloud, kind of like wavering of it, it it's sort of mysterious. And it, uh, it will take some time for it to settle and for me to feel that it's, that is really my destination. So it will come as I creep slowly into altitude towards it.
So we are at 4,817 meters. So we are higher than the highest point in the Alps. But as I climb, I feel the pressure increasing on my head. A little slower than the boys, but uh, that's okay. Almost at 5,000 meters. Summit, baby. You've made it. Yeah. Think about Uh huh. 5,000 yeah. meters high. I feel good, I have a headache, but it's not getting worse, so I'm not going to be concerned about it. That's normal, that's the usual pattern from the altitude. And the window closes. It's closing. Nepal has over 3,000 glaciers and more than 2,000 lakes, of which 26 are on the verge of bursting. Here we walk over the rubble of a flood from 2007. Tsering Lapka Sherpa witnessed this from his home, nestled at the foot of the mighty Kumbu Glacier. And I want to hear his story. You have a lodge here, you are giving people a break before yeah. they continue up. And, but you also are in the middle of two big riverbeds, one yes. over here and then one over there. Yeah. And something has happened 32 years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> 32 years come with us this way, this way, just on my parents' side. And after 32 years, come this way, twice or three times. And maybe some days come this way. Very really dangerous, looks. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? It would be horrible when that breaks, yeah. for sure. Uh. The legs go up, the glaciers go open, then Flat. go like this. Yeah. In 2007, it happened again. And this time it was very close to your lodge. Yeah, because of the sounds, like, 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 the sound. like earthquake. Earthquake? Like yeah, like this. Because of the, the stone, the waters, very thick, mm -hmm. they move very slow, the, the rock was hitting each other, then like earthquake, like this. But I'm very worried, I'm very worried because of the old wash, many, many big happens because the old bridges wash. All the bridges wash they, out? Like, you know, the Tenboche below the Tenboche, the Furishe, the old bridges gone. Are you afraid that in maybe 20, 40 years you, there's no more water in here in the Himalaya? Yeah, put it. Because every year is not 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 the snow, only windy. Because the wind wind get a blind all the snow. And only windy. Yeah, yeah, and and the monsoon they have a very hard sun, and and only rocky mountains. Forty years after, not white snow, very dry, and not water in the in the in the Himalayas. How out of whack the world's climate really is, we experience firsthand as we wake up in snow. As if the Himalaya plays a trick on us and flip-flop seasons overnight. At least the animals like the moisture, but for the mountains it's too late. The sun will evaporate the snow despite the altitude and the groundwater is left with nothing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Relatively little science has been done on the highest mountains because they're so hostile and inaccessible. Two years ago, climbers and Sherpas of the Pyramid Scientific Research Center carried up a weather station to the South Col at 8,000 meters. There they record and monitor temperature, wind and moisture, among other things. Last year, the station measured a balmy zero degrees in August, which shocked everybody because it's the first time we have hard data that heat is trapped at higher layers of our atmosphere. All the data collected from stations such as the pyramid is sent by satellite to research stations around the world, so we can examine climate change at a global level. One of these centers is Isimot in Kathmandu. Most of the glaciers are retreating, most of the glaciers in the Himalaya. And if you compare with the global scenario, like if you go to the Alps or Scandinavia, Caucasus, or even the, the Alaskan glaciers, these black squares, this is the Himalayan glacier which is retreating very fast compared to other glaciers like the Alps or the Scandinavian glaciers. It's alarming. Alarming. Yeah. If you look at the Asian rivers, uh, which is originated from the Himalaya, 10 major rivers of the Asia is originating from the Himalayan glaciers. So it's a lifeline for the one third of the humanity, if you count the total population of the world. One third of the world population the is world in the, population. this 10 river basin. And this is the picture of the Imja glacier. Like Fritz Murl, who started the global uh, world glacial monitoring system. He was in the Nepal uh, Himalaya also in 1956, a few months. And he, he took this photograph. This is the Imja glacier here, and you don't see any lake here, formation of the lake. But after 50 years, you can see the same glacier is some vertical collapse, but there is a formation of the lake by retreat of this Imja glacier, which is more than a one kilometer retreat of this Imja glacier. It's shrinking vertically, also retreating horizontally. Yeah. Imja Lake grows 73 meters a year. But when is the bathtub full? To see statistics and listen to the experts talking about it is one thing. But now coming here and seeing the size of this lake really leaves an impact on me. <coughs> the biggest concern is if a chunk of ice falls in the lake and creates a tsunami, breaking the dam with incredible force. When you were here in the 90s, yeah. how approximately, how about, big was this lake here? About half. About half? I would, I would estimate. Tukla might seem like a problem, but if this lake burst, the villages that we've just visited below will be washed away, along with their fields, yaks, shrines and everything. You're living right at Imja Lake, mm -hmm. and some people think it may burst soon. Other people think it's not so threatening. How do you feel about that? Uh, Imja Lake, we heard many years ago. I was very young. They say uh, Imja Lake is getting now getting bigger and bigger. People say, oh, this year broken, coming down, wash up, you know. Some people say not. But who's right, who's wrong, we don't know. No, the Sherpa people have no... No idea. No idea. No West, Western people come, they're checking, they make money, they're going back. Mm -hmm. If the people research coming here, but they need to tell. Yeah. But they never tell. Yeah. But if the Indian lake coming broke down, is the house is not all washed up. You know? Your house will be gone. Yeah, everything, everything yeah. is gone, yeah. yeah. We hope not. Yes. <laughs> Wow. 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 Okay, good luck. Thank you. Good luck. I'm very happy. Happy to have you here. <laughs> and uh, after some we see you. I'll come and okay. tell you all about it. Okay. okay. <laughs> good luck, camera. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you live, do you think? I think the 
living up here. Before continuing, all Sherpas and climbers visit Lama Geshi. He's one of the most respected spiritual leaders in the Solo Kumbu. Namaste. I wondered what his take might be on the changing climate in these valleys. It would be something to what I used to be. Tis up to the Bitter is so up, drop, be drop, be sick, be gone, be zetty, lava, bobos head up. Two bodies, the little two car, the pit to the little bidon, Saba, the pit to the little bidon, to drop, 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 Saza terrible, to draw, just reduce. Should we listen more to nature, what nature can teach us? Yes, till I do what she says, she be loo, said she, she was a dollar or such. Before leaving, I wondered whether Lama Geshi could also add a text to the banner we were carrying. What I learned from Lama Geshi is that climate change is just an act of karma. And all we need to do is do good for our Earth to find balance again. The scientists are slowly coming to that same conclusion. They just call it reversing the tipping point by cutting our CO2 emissions. I mean, the clouds come in and go, and it just snows, and then there's thunder and lightning, and then sunshine. It changes every five minutes. It's kind of cool. We think of mountains as permanent and unchanging, sturdy rocks here forever. But they're just as sensitive to climate change as rainforests and coral reefs. And here, in the cradle of the highest mountains in the world, I see how vulnerable they have become. The goddess of the sky, Chomalungbo, what is she thinking about climate change? I never really thought that it would be so hard to climb a hill. <laughs> because every breath I take, I have intense pain in my chest. Yeah, be cold. Put this up and wait for this. Approaching 5,000 meters, the altitude really hit me. We were now near the limit to where the body can adapt. At 6,000 meters, for example, you can eat as much as you like, but you just lose weight. For now, at this height, it's a question of taking it easy and giving the body the time to adapt. Did you see? Fantastic sight, huh? I know in a month I'll be up there. For the first time I feel it's attainable. And 
and it's doable. And I can actually see myself getting up Everest. So it feels good. It feels good to be here. Climbing Everest is all about adjusting to altitude slowly, nothing too rushed. Before attempting Everest itself, we prepare to climb a smaller mountain, Island Peak. At over 6,000 meters, it provides an excellent training and hopefully will help with my stubborn process of getting used to the altitude. <laughs> I am curious to see the changes in the snow and ice covered altitude. It will be our first real search for evidence. Altitude you can't rush, but climbing Himalayan mountains is all about getting up and down as quick as you can to minimize exposure to danger. The price for Island Peak is high. A 2 a.m. wake-up call, stuff some oatmeal in your throat, a sip of coffee and off you go. As daylight comes, we are rewarded with breathtaking views. It's all worthwhile. When we reach the snow line, we see the first signs of melting. We're just about at the uh, last 150 meters of Island Peak. It's 8.45 in the morning. The glacier used to be all the way up there and it receded far enough up there now. So now all you see is bare rock all the way down the valley. Now this is good training for a climb on Everest because uh, we're simulating uh, what we'll encounter on the Lhotse face, which is, you know, between 6,000 and 7,000 meters, so. It feels like climbing a melting wedding cake. The ice is soft, you sink in till your thighs, and the whole slope is less stable. It has made the mountain much harder and more dangerous to climb. Okay, we're at 6,100 meters, and uh, what we see behind us, the fixed line is to the to the summit. But it's very different than other years, so Walter. Yeah, in other years the ridge is not as sharp, and especially the summit. Uh, became much more smaller. So usually the summit has been a similar area to this one, here where we stand, and today it was not possible to stay unprotected on the summit. I have been three years ago last time here, and since then I would estimate half of the snow. Wow. It took a little longer than we wanted to, but this will get us into perfect preparation for Everest. Three days later, we arrive in Everest Base Camp, our home for the next six weeks. Sitting there, looking a little vulnerable on the edge of the Kumbu Glacier. When all the climbers have arrived, there will be more than 600 people here in Base Camp. And 600 people produce a lot of trash. But it is now strictly regulated by the National Park Service. Every piece is carried out, including human waste. Base Camp is a mini village that has everything you need, including a Belgian bakery and a well-stocked medical tent.
I'm happy to be here. It is a chance to relax, catch up on some sleep, talk to other climbers, and simply chill in one place for some time. But it's popular among the Germans. <laughs> We set up our media equipment in a communication stand. Today we have a special challenge. Along with our regular daily dispatches, I have a video call planned with the Dutch Minister for Environment. She's opening an exhibit in The Hague for school kids who are following our climb. Ah, goed. So, that was even schrikken. Where you been there? Hallo iedereen naar in museo in Den Haag. Hoe gaat het daar? Dit is Jacqueline Kramer. Dit is uh, Jacqueline Kramer. Vertel eens, wat hebben jullie nu gezien van uh, de klimaatverandering? Kun je dat er echt gewoon nou, nu al het... zien? Ja, nou het, het allerergste op dit moment is dus dat ze dus voor het derde jaar achterin volgen van oktober tot en met maart geen enkel uh, vlok sneeuw of druppel regen is gevallen. En heel concreet houdt dat in dat er voor een aantal dorpen hier, heel hoog op Himalaya, gewoon geen water is. En dus dat is, dat is het allerergste probleem. Het tweede probleem is dus, omdat er geen toevoer is van sneeuw, de gletsjers enorm aan het smelten zijn. Veel sneller dan men had gedacht. En niet zozeer in de lengte, maar eigenlijk meer in de dikte. En dus voor de Sherpa mensen die hier wonen op deze hoogte is dat heel problematisch. Nou, Inderdaad. wij wensen jou uh, ja. heel veel succes met uh, het Basecamp Himalaya Alert, wat we nu gaan openen. En uh, hou vol. Dankjewel, dat komt allemaal goed voor elkaar. Het echte werk gaat nu beginnen, maar we zijn heel goed. Ja. Before any of the teams begin climbing, the Sherpas hold a puja ceremony, an offering to ask the gods of the mountain for protection in the upcoming weeks. One of the things that is happening is that the, the protective powers of the mountains is um, getting lower. I, because of our uh, misbehavior, the mountains are not able to protect us a, a, as much anymore. And so by taking these, uh, these urns, uh, filled with 400 different elements uh, from all over the world, things like uh, shreds of rope from llamas, precious metals, uh, ashes, and we have been uh, chosen by the Thing Rinpoche to take it to the summit of uh, Mount Everest. And by putting these uh, urns at the top of uh, each mountain, we'll, we hope that we'll be able to get that uh, uh, sanctity back. Uh, that's, that's the hope. One of the Sherpas was saying it's like giving the mountain aspirin to make it feel better so that it is better able to protect us again. <laughs> We were all going to need the gods on our side. Although each year now hundreds come to climb the world's tallest mountain, it still has many dangers. Most climbers consider the Kumbu Icefall the most hazardous part of the climb. Around 25 times I have climbed through the icefall right now. And the upper part is the most dangerous because there are avalanches from the west shoulder from, from Everest down and avalanches from Nukce from the other side down. Um, the main difference is the amount of ladders and the length of the ladders every year. This year we have many ladders, but short ladders. But the last 10% for me look more dangerous than usual, especially from the hanging glaciers from the west shoulder. I personally am always very afraid of the ice. Yeah? And what I, are you afraid of? Uh, that, I, that the ice uh, cube collapse in the US, yeah. and you will hang into a fixed line. And is one is one and on and the devil avalanche danger from the side. Yeah. Felix is testing the effects of Viagra on the heart at altitude. And using ultrasound, he finds that Viagra reduces the size of the right heart chamber, 
in both Western and Sherpa climbers. This should make it possible to deal better with altitude problems. So, next one, Lakpa. Lapkanura Sherpa and I get along really well. His positive, upbeat attitude makes him such a joy to be with. <laughs> we have so much fun on the mountain and often joke about summiting together. Well, the thickness uh, I have enlarged. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, so, yeah, thank you. Here sits. Is it normal? Huh? Yeah, it's normal, absolutely. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're still alive. Ah, <laughs> yeah. I'm still alive. <laughs> To adjust to the altitude, you have to make a number of short trips up and down the mountain before making a final push for the summit. These are called rotations. That means on a normal expedition, you have to climb through the Kumba Icefall six times. The ladders over the crevasses need to be adjusted daily, as the icefall is constantly moving on the slope. Hard on the knees. <laughs> The route has already collapsed three times this week, and there have been four near misses with rock falls. At Kambuan, I wondered how Felix was feeling. What was it like to go through the Kumbu Icefall? Um, to be honest, I was, at first I was a little bit nervous. And on the, on the one side, I think you saw it too, when the avalanches come down, scary, it eh? was a little bit scary, yeah. Yeah, yeah did <laughs> you notice how all the Sherpas run and then they start praying? No, no. Oh, I just ran. <laughs> <laughs> During our second rotation, we again have to negotiate the Kumbu Icefall. In Kemwan, a girl had just told me that there had been an avalanche in the icefall at 4 o'clock that morning. I tightened the strap on my helmet extra securely and Lopke and I started down the ladders. It was hot. I could have just worn a t-shirt. What a dangerous place. With good help of Lapka. <coughs> 60 ladders in the Kumba Icefall. We have three more to go. I'm psyched. Then it's over. <laughs> right, Lapka? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're almost there as the first chunk of ice breaks off. Wow. It's a hell no. Not a big. This guy here, maybe better. I think we can oh, continue. We can continue. I think we can continue. I don't know that big one. I think it's so warm we should continue. This is more safe here. Okay, let's hurry. <laughs> Go the next 20 minutes as fast as you can. We had just crossed the last ladder when a third avalanche came down. This time it's massive, and within seconds we were hit by a mass of snow and ice. It just lasted forever. You, you know, you keep falling and falling and falling, and it's a really eerie feeling. It's not pleasant. And then you think, when is this going to stop? And when it's going to stop, I'm dead. That's basically what runs through your head. Name is on beide Pumpelzon, bis auf mental halt. Was wenn du halbe Stunde Kopf nach unten in der Spalten hängst? Und die nicht rühren kannst, weil du fest, festgefahren bist, dann hast du angeschlossen mit deinem Leben. Ich habe einen Riesenmasel gehabt, also das, das war schon knapp 15 Meter in die Spalten eingespalt von einer Riesenlamine. 
Vi er godt til at køre på pløje, for ikke sige, at haft en kat. Men det er så jeg på ikke på uden, det er sådan et fugtbordragisk. Hun så jeg på naturlig. Het was zo chockerend en ja, dit is gewoon een act van nature. En ja, tot op vandaag weten we nog steeds niet wat er met Lapka is gebeurd. Hij stond gewoon echt in de line of fire. Hij stond echt midden in de brunt van die lawine. En ja, dat is, het was gewoon een, echt op het verkeerde moment zijn. Het was het, het, we hadden, als we twee meter naar links waren geweest, twee meter, was er niks gebeurd. Er zijn zoveel gletsjerspleten waar die in zou kunnen liggen. En bovendien... De lawine raast nu iedere keer hetzelfde pad, dus het is al drie keer dezelfde weg op uh, langsgekomen. Dus de kans is erg klein dat, uh, dat, dat mensen daar gewoon eindeloos tijd moeten gaan doorbrengen om voor een lijk te gaan zoeken. Het is gewoon te gevaarlijk. You were trying to, to scrape the ice to try to get out, right? Yeah, to, to, to get the help. Yep. And then what happened with your fingers? The nails break. And now? You have no feelings in them, right? Uh, I think my fingers were... Well, I think the nerves are damaged. Sleeping. I have to close this, this chapter, otherwise I wouldn't climb up again. Uh. Yeah. Well, we'll have to go back up there when we go back up to Camp 2. Mm -hmm. we'll, have to, we'll have to do something for Lapka once we pass. We have to leave something for him, a shawl. You know, I, I, I haven't even cried about Lapka. I don't know why. I mean, I have not bulked and go completely... You know, like, cried my eyes out about him. I can't. I don't know why. But if you... You cried more than I have. If you continue <coughs> with that life, you have to accept there are accidents in the mountains, like car driving. Nobody asks somebody to stop car driving because there hasn't been an accident. Mm -hmm. But mountaineering is more... is more emotional. You have more sunny sides and you have also shadow sides. And you have to accept the shadow side and you have to deal with this. And I think it's in, in the best sense of Lapka because he, has so, he had so much fun on the mountain. He likes this mountain climbing. I'm totally, absolutely sure that it's in his mind and his sense to continue the climb in his, in his memory or in his, yeah. in his sense. Yeah? Mind in his memory. We needed more time to recover. And that's very difficult at the altitude of base camp. So we decided to go down to get some better food, sleep and more oxygen. Just above Tukla, there's a row of memorials to all those who have died on Everest. It could so easily have been our names on one of these stones. I think of Lapka often and wonder if they will ever find his body. Two weeks later, after a week of stormy weather lashing the summit, we get a weather report that conditions will be fine for the coming days. The break we have taken at lower altitude had given us back our strength and motivation. The climb on the Lotsi face to Camp 3 is really tough. Because of the effort it takes to climb a 60 degree slope, at an altitude over 7,000 meters. Camp 3 is not very comfortable. It's steamy hot over 30 degrees. And because of the steep slope, you're stuck in your tent. We try to keep our daily contacts with our sponsors, but that proves difficult, as reception is bad now, now we're so close to the Chinese border. We had a fantastic rest in the afternoon, but the way up was very hard. Let's hope that the weather stays stable. 
the forecast, all the forecasts are good, so it should work. You can see it. The next day we start early for Camp 4. Okay, how do you feel? I feel really good. Yeah. We are at 8000 meter. This is the last part of the Ganfus <laughs> Fair. And then we have half an hour of light traverse to the South Pole. Okay. By noon, Walter and I stumble onto the South Pole. At almost 8,000 meters, it's the highest pass in the world. The Sherpas get $100 to take an oxygen bottle back to base camp, but the gas canisters just pile up slowly. Not too windy, I think. This wind, we can go. As long as the wind doesn't get worse, the plan is to start out for the summit around 10 o'clock this evening. We're in the death zone, so we take oxygen to sleep. After all this time, we've now reached this point. I don't feel like sleeping and can't wait to go. Progress is hard and there is much less snow than usual and walking with ice crampons on bare rock is tough going. As day breaks we find ourselves climbing with an American team. We're all trying to reach the summit before a storm hits, now moving up from the Bay of Bengal. We arrive at the base of the famed Hillary Step, and comparing that with a photograph Walter took in 2006, it's clear that much of the ice is now gone. I pick up a stone to lay on the summit as the weather moves in. There was a lot of pressure to keep going, knowing that the storm is on our heels. Summit at Everest this morning. At 7.30 we stood on the top. It was tough going, it was very hard. I had troubles with my oxygen mask, it froze up which didn't give me oxygen at all. So that freaked me out and we had to get chopped the ice out of my mask. <clears throat> Got a little snow blind. But all in all, we summited at 7.30. With the wind now really picking up, we unfold the banner with the children's messages on it. Will these messages, just like the Tibetan prayer flags around us, be heard around the world? On our descent, the storm really kicks in. Tired. Walter is completely done. He's he said it was one of the hardest expeditions he has done just because of our whole history on Everest now and so we just drink a lot of water. We were completely hungry, dehydrated. We haven't really eaten anything for 24 hours. And so I'm gonna breathe some oxygen. We're at 8,000 meters and tomorrow we'll go down and Sometime in Kathmandu we're going to celebrate our 
Summit, I'm sure. <laughs> Reaching the summit was never my main goal, but I'm glad to have made it considering all the hardship and misfortune we had. It gave us a lot of insights about what is happening with the climate at extreme altitudes. The effect on the Sherpa people in these valleys will be dramatic, but they won't be the only ones affected. If the Himalayas lose their snow and ice, much of the water supply to Asia's 10 largest rivers will dry up, threatening the food security of almost one and a half billion people. Just imagine Asia without the ability to grow rice. The Himalayas and other threatened areas, such as the Arctic and the Antarctic, are the world's early warning system. And the red light is now flashing. Climate change is real. We can turn it back, but we can curb its effects with disciplined measures and global cooperation. Surprisingly, there is a strong agreement between the Asian Buddhist traditions of the Sherpas and the latest findings of modern science. Both stress our deep interconnection and interdependence with the natural world. We and all nature are inseparable, all one. And ultimately the challenges we face can only be tackled when we realize this fundamental fact. Zie je dat? Zo ergens ga je helemaal door het ijs heen. Dat je eraan herinnert hoe heilig het ooggaatje van. Uh... Ik geef het even door, dan kun je het zien. 